Tonight we're learning new details about the investigation of a local police officer, the arrest of Scott Rock. We have breaking news to tell you about. Police say three... Very active crime scene. A sex offender is back in jail tonight after a violent attack at the... We have a crew headed to the scene. And we will have more information. John Marisco says the average customer would save four hundred dollars a year with this terminal. But Fox, if you want to know. I'll be there. Yes, I'm the reporter. I mean, if you if you have some records for me to look at, that would be great. I'd be happy to do that. I do look at myself as an artist. A lot of people don't, but. Some days you're a short order cook and some days you're a chef. Andy, 31. It's a powerful tool because you're funneling everything through yourself. And I also think that it's an opportunity to lend a voice to groups of people who may not be able to do that. Testing, testing. Johnny D, they're saying the mic sounds a little funny. We're so wrapped up in breaking news. don't have a lot of time, so you're really pumping it out. But this is what I love to do. Stand by. It twice. He says it twice. I didn't it. Go. I mean, you tell me what you want to do. It's 526. I don't know where we are in the show. TV reporters are used to deadlines. But it's the dollar's part that can make the job even harder. That's why if you've ever complained about what's being covered, you should know about the dollar's part. Journalism has always had to make money to exist. That's how journalists are paid. But critics say the ability to bring in more advertising dollars has prompted many local TV stations to add more newscasts. So some stations have to feed this hungry beast five to six hours every weekday. Journalism advocates say the problem then becomes reporters are stretched too thin. The reality is that, that television news, like any other uh, uh, aspect of journalism, is a business. And if we don't have viewers, we don't have a business. This idea refutes the polemic criticism of news coverage. I do think people who say, well, the media, you know, for what that means, it's so broad, is liberal, or the media is conservative, are missing the mark, because I think both of those arguments are wrong. And it kind of misses what is the motivating factor, um, you know, in the news business. And I think what drives it is... Um, the, the search for profits. Tom Rosensteel is the director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism in Washington, D.C., a think tank that studies the news media. He calls the current way of doing business in local TV news operating for maximum profit and efficiency. The problem with treating news largely as a business from inside is that you can sort of boost your ratings uh, in the short run and erode public trust and public confidence and your ratings in the long run, all at the same time. It's the contract with the public that has kept Len Bestoff going for 20 years. He does journalism the old-fashioned way. He works the shoe leather, like here at Manchester, before it's time to clock in usually coming up with his own story ideas for WFSB-TV in Hartford. Really? I, in some ways, consider myself a dinosaur because, you know, I do things the old-fashioned way. How many people and are you talking? People tease me sometimes. You know, they call me old school and this and that. But I think in a, a friendly way. They realize that it does get results. Hey, how you doing? Good, good, good. You've got to want it, A. You've got to be willing to make that investment in yourself. A lot of people don't. And the, the benefits, the dividends that it has paid already, you can see that phone ringing today. You've heard it even beep a few times while we're doing the interview. So as far as five and six, we're probably looking stronger once we get some information on the case. Um, potential six o'clock story is that this guy was uh, pinched for sex assault before, but he's not on the state register. Staying in touch with his producers is just well, the know, tip of the iceberg. This particular day epitomizes the top three challenges reporters have to deal with as they help feed the hungry beast. 
Cover crime. Scary. <laughs> Thanks for Do multiple know. stories in a day. He grabbed her by the top of the head and throat. And, and go live. Stand by. Police say the 20-year-old forced himself on a young neighbor under a stairwell at the apartment complex where they live, leaving neighbors... Uh, you know, people aren't exposed to a lot of these things, and people need to know that these things do happen, and you need to keep your awareness up. You could say, okay, that's a rationale for doing that story, that's an excuse for doing that story, you do too many of those stories, and I'm not going to argue with you. Um, we may. It is crime and spot news, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of that stuff, mm -hmm. and it leads, very often it leads the newscast. Your reaction to why, why this is going on and how do you feel about it? Why it's going on, I mean, let's face it, it's easy. It's cheaper because there's, it's there. There's less investment in time in many cases. Um, you can read it off a police blotter. You can steal it from the newspaper. You can catch it off the scanner. How I feel about it is I'm not real thrilled with it. Uh, I, guess, I guess let me put it to you this way. I think that there is a place for crime news, but I think it is way overweighted right now. Whether it's economics or it's just that the people in charge think that that's what people are going to watch. And there may be you know, empirical data that's saying that. Uh, that is where it's at right now. Jim Terracani is an investigative reporter at WJAR-TV in Providence. Here at a journalism convention, he's crusading for a federal shield law after he himself was sentenced in 2004 for not revealing a source. Terracani has been a journalist for three decades. Well, crime's easy. Crime's easy, crime's lazy. You can send a cameraman out without a reporter and record a fatal accident. Or, or the aftermath of a murder scene with the yellow tape up, or a robbery, and go get a soundbite from the police officer, or go, go get these ridiculous soundbites from a neighbor who says the mass murderer next door was such a nice guy, he coached Little League, which has become such a cliche, and it informs people of nothing. And the way we cover those things, the way we cover a fatal traffic accident is so disingenuous if we covered it, if we wanted to really cover a fatal traffic accident, then we should show the blood dripping out of the car and the screams coming when we arrived on the scene early of the people in the car. Because maybe that might get people to stop drinking and driving. But we don't cover it that way. We show the homogenized version. We show the body bag being, being taken away and everything is all neat and proper. And then the story ends. But the reality is that going back reflexively to the crime story, to the flashing light story, will not build your ratings. It won't. It's just a reflex. It's a rut that people get into, that people in local TV news get into. And it's a safe one because everybody all over the country is doing it and no one ever lost their job for doing what everybody else is doing. PEJ looked at eight stations in Houston, Milwaukee, and Medford, Oregon for one day in 2005. The study found that on the late newscasts, 50 percent of the stories were about crime or spot news. Spot news means accidents, fires, and disasters. Now, some stations save longer in-depth stories for their five or six o'clock newscasts, but bombard viewers on their late casts with crime and spot news. Hartford, New Haven is no exception. We watched WFSB and WTNH for four weeks in the spring of 2006 and found they devoted 58% of their news stories to crime and spot news at 11 o'clock. Although crime is big for those two stations, notice how spot news is much more prevalent than the PEJ stations. It was an uh, outstanding achievement for newscast here at, uh, in Atlanta at the CBS station. Mike Cavender has spent two decades in TV news, serving as a news director in markets such as Nashville, Atlanta, and Tampa, and chairing the Radio and Television News Directors Association. He later turned to consulting work. I'm not nearly as convinced that viewers want as much crime, as much uh, spot news, um, as much, uh, you know, what I call the... Uh, the, the happening events, uh, as we think they do. 
And, and I, I hear this, whether, whether I'm in Phoenix or I'm in, in, uh, in uh, somewhere in the Northeast, and, and I've heard this from viewers over and over again. I think television stations, news departments, have fallen into, at least to some extent, the, uh, the trap, if you will, of providing that, that kind of, of news because it's easy, it's quick, and you can do a lot of it with a relatively small staff. What viewers aren't getting more of is government and infrastructure stories. Stories about education, communications, transportation, utilities. Remember the graph you just saw about crime and spot news? Well, only 13% of the stories on the PEJ stations were devoted to government and infrastructure stories. On WFSB, the number of stories was 5%. And on WTNH, the number was 10%. Bob Rockstro has done it all on local TV news for 31 years, working in seven markets ranging from Sioux Falls to San Francisco. He's been an anchor, producer, assignment editor, and for the past five years at Fox 61 in Hartford, he was assistant news director and later news director. His philosophy is less breaking news and more context. It's a great story. Where'd that happen? Those stories are a little difficult to tell and they don't always lend themselves to being really good television stories. So they take more time to develop, hence more resources. And if there's breaking news and you want to have a fast paced show with a little high story content, those are the kind of stories that can kind of make things come to a halt, um, both from a resource standpoint and time allotment inside a newscast. But you tend to do more of those kinds of stories. We do, but we always try and find uh, that central figure that we can tell the story around so it's not just going down to the mayor's office and listening to the mayor's sound bites. We try to take it out of the mayor's office and find a person on the street who's going to be affected by that program and tell the story through them so at least it's uh, getting it out of the politician's office. In three, and two, and one. A judge sets a young man's bond at $5 million after police say he raped a woman in this apartment complex and then tried to kill her. I think it makes people uh, fearful. I think it isolates people, makes them feel like they're, uh, that the world is much more dangerous than it really is. I think it's pretty trashy and all about violence and not, they use lead-ins and to try to catch you and they're not the stories are just all the same and not quality. Really kind of overwhelming. Every time I turn on, there's something bad, a murder, and basically that's why I think of it. It's very negative. Regardless of the type of story, reporters are faced with doing more than one version. What the viewer sees is the content, the final product not the editing process, where visuals and sound bites are dropped and added. Everything you got? Everything you got saw. All right, in three, and two, and one. Police got called to this apartment complex for... On this day, Len did the rape story three times. A short version for the newscast at noon, a longer version for the five, and another for the six. Now, Keyless has been put on a mental health watch, and coming up at 6, we'll tell you about how this is not the first time he has been charged with rape. We're live with the Mobile Newsroom in East Hartford, Len Bestoff, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. This is a technique newsrooms use, getting reporters to save information learned earlier in the day and not revealing it until the next newscast. Oops, sorry. Aaron Cox at New Haven's WTNH does the same thing, only with a different story. Flood damage in Waterbury. Aaron started out as a newspaper reporter nearly two decades ago. She is known for her tenacity and strong writing skills. 1241, just, can I just hear 1241 please? On this day, Aaron's load is a little lighter than Len's. Only two versions of the same story, instead of three. While the photographer edits the first story, Aaron writes the second one. some pretty serious bills. The biggest part of my job is time management. Uh, the deadline never moves. Every day it's five and six o'clock. 
uh, sometimes noon, five and six o'clock, but the deadline never changes. Whether you have equipment failure, whether you're traveling from Goshen to Groton, the deadline is the same. And it's frustrating because sometimes you don't feel you're able to share as much of the story as you have learned um, with your viewer. I mean, I've learned so much today, but I am time limited and even uh, in the amount of time I can give the story because there's so many stories that the newscast has to get in. So that, that can be frustrating. How's that? I'm Cox. They want different bites, you know, different sound bites. And it's, so I'm trying to remember what I used or haven't used to tell a different story. Thanks to Aaron's ability to produce it right under pressure, the challenge of doing multiple stories in a day once again gets done. Roads could crumble, even collapse. More rain leads to rushing, gushing water. Here, Aaron's five o'clock version focuses on the big picture, the overall damage and safety issues in Waterbury. One down, one to go. Her second version for the 6 o'clock newscast focuses more on the human aspect, using three sound bites with this resident. You could ask yourself, why not do one comprehensive story with all of these elements, instead of breaking them down into two separate stories? The people at home, I can't believe they'd ever know the difference. They're not paying attention. News goes by in a flash. And, and the typical viewer is, is what, doing five different things when they're watching a television newscast? No one's sitting in front of the TV like a, a news director looks at a package in an edit booth, that's for sure. And so when we make these, quote, changes by changing a soundbite or maybe two or three scenes of video, who's going to know? Who's really going to know? I can't believe the viewer's going to know. So I think it's just, you know, playing with ourselves, quite frankly. <laughs> You're in the local TV news business. You're in a very, very, very difficult spot. It's a much harder business and a much harder profession, a much harder public interest mission to fulfill than it was a, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Okay, take that again in three, two. The controversial Broadwater natural gas terminal is up for debate again tonight. We'll take you to the public hearing in New London. Fantastic. We're set at uh, 40 people, for example. Uh, it, it'll be up to me how many of those people are reporters, photographers, producers, etc. We have eight full-time reporters on our staff right now, and that seems to be a number that's been constant over the five years that I've been here. And uh, would I like more? Sure. <laughs> I'd love to be able to give reporters more time to develop stories and not have to worry about turning a day out of package. And we, we do have a couple of days, like Tuesdays and Wednesdays, when everybody is here for, just because of overlap. And we can't afford to give people days off the road, especially during the sweeps periods when people are doing special assignments. This early? Hi, it's Walt Kane with News 12 New Jersey. You called uh, the other day. Hi, what's up? Yeah, she said, uh, I guess you guys had a, a problem or something that uh, you wanted to investigate. Sure. News 12 New Jersey may not have more reporters, but it did hire a reporter specifically to do in-depth stories. Walt Kane is the cable news station's investigative reporter, turning out an average of 48 stories a year, roughly four a month. That's a far cry from two or three stories a day. You know, a lot of the time, we look at 20 emails a day, or emails or voicemails. On this day, Walt looked into a housing complaint that didn't pan out. Not a big deal, because he has the luxury of not having to feed the beast every day. Responsibility to fix the roof. It's well, probably their landlords. We got to fix the roof. She, uh, she has copy release. I don't have to do a lot of the mindless live shots. I don't, I'll tell you what I don't miss about general assignment news. I don't miss going out there on the day after Thanksgiving to the mall where people are shopping just like they were the day after Thanksgiving last year and the year before and the year before that. I mean, that stuff I don't miss at all. It's 4.55 in the morning, Black Friday. WTNH's Jody Latina is about to do four live shots to help fill the morning newscast. 
Now I promised you a special guest, and in straight from the North Pole. Here he is, the man of the hour. Santa, how are you? Good, Jody, how are you? I like to uh, kind of wing it, if you will. I feel like sometimes your personality comes out a little more, and I think you can make it interesting. If something's going on, you can really show people and make it interactive. Uh, I do have a problem with live for the sake of live. Um, if there's nothing going on and there's nothing to show, I really don't prefer to stand in front of a building. I don't think it really does anything for the viewer. The people I know in local TV news uh, might call them laugh shots. Uh, they're standing in front of a building. Uh, the event happened you know, hours ago. The story, the package, is daylight. Uh, their stand-up is in the dark. Uh, we're, you know, we're here at Mercy Hospital and where uh, Ted Miller tonight is fighting for his life. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, tonight, Ted Miller is not doing anything really differently than he was doing at four in the afternoon when the accident happened. There is no new update. The story, everything about the story is from the, that afternoon. And there's no point in that person standing in front of that, uh, of that hospital except a formula that says we need a live shot to update the story. If there were new information, that would be one thing. If there were a reason to be standing there. But if it's just the atmospherics, we've done focus groups that show that the viewers are laughing. Live at the zoo tonight to show us what happened next. Core? Kelly, four Oregon Forestry Center workers uh, disrupted this attack on the woman and her two children at around 10.30 this morning. The workers... You know, you hear about survey after survey and focus group after focus group that says this is what the viewers want. Viewers respond to the live bug. They respond to the, um, you know, the... the uh, the fact that anything can happen, it's live, you know, so there is an energy to a live shot. Um, but live shots, for the most part, don't really uh, teach anyone anything. They're for entertainment purposes, I think. Andy, you are next. Unfortunately, there's this competition. If someone else says something and you don't, and they're live and you're not, you know, heads roll and it's terrible so you have to run to each and everything you have to go out there and see if it's worth something and that's just the business Giuliani's in London. I think we should at least get a fight with the guy. I mean, he, about what though? He's Lori just said he's on the commission. He's so far down. Stations I mean, hold meetings like this one once or even twice a day. It's where everyone, producers, reporters, photographers, and the news director decide what to cover. This station, Fox 61 in Hartford, only has an hour newscast at 10 p.m. to worry about. But many other stations have a five to six hour news hole to fill every weekday. Let's talk a little bit about the news hole too. That's part of the problem. We're stuffing sausage now. Yeah. And uh, We have to fill yeah. time. And when you have to fill time, and, and, and in most markets, other than maybe the top five markets, or maybe the top ten markets, where you have these huge metropolises, you know, New York, Chicago, LA, Boston, Miami, there's not enough real news to fill the time, real legitimate news. So what do you do? You go out and do the crime, you do the dog stories, you do the pet stories, you do this, the, the cutesy feature stories. And, and so we're giving the audiences or our viewers entertainment. When people watch the news, there's the water, color, water cooler stories, you know, the really weird things that you talk about the next day. Did you hear about that freak? situation and then there's the more in-depth in pieces that are really good quality that people remember the rest of it is almost I don't think they remember it five minutes later so why not fill one newscast a day with quality stories rather than several newscasts with stories that affect so few people because studies show newscasts make money no matter what the content one of the things that we've seen over the years is we've seen fewer family-owned businesses in the media and as a result uh, and a lot more uh, uh, media ownership in public companies uh, through public companies so so now there is 
pressure from shareholders, there is pressure uh, uh, from other constituencies to make money, to make more money, I should say, excuse me, and, and to be as profitable as possible. That has changed the dynamic in the business considerably. A 2006 Harris poll helps explain why TV stations have been profitable. 77% of American adults watch local TV news at least three times a week. That may sound good, but over the years, viewership has dropped. In fact, PEJ reported a drop in local news viewers from 2005 to 2006 for the evening, late, and morning news for the February, May, July, and November ratings periods. Notice that only the ratings for the July evening newscasts saw no change. Almost to a person, the, the, the people that I know in local TV news feel that they're sort of swimming against those pressures. They got into the business for uh, usually the public interest. Most people who, who became TV reporters, you know, aren't that great with numbers and didn't want to be worrying about, you know, uh, the bottom line. Uh, they wanted to be chasing the big story and, and telling people what was going on. Um, and they found themselves in this situation. Uh, and there are enormous pressures. I mean, when you're in the news director's chair, you're responsible for so much more other than just the show's content. Uh, when I, I got in the business, I was on air to begin with, then switched over to producing, and that was probably the most fun I've had because all I had to worry about was just filling my newscast, and I could spend the entire day doing that. When you get into management, you're concerned with budgetary concerns, with uh, overtime, with uh, scheduling. Critics blame the concentration of media ownership for the increased pressure to make a profit. The Federal Communications Commission allowed consolidation to occur by relaxing ownership rules over the years. This has allowed companies to buy up TV stations and make even more money. Our newsrooms are now profit dri driven and our news managers are closely watched by the managers of the stations to make sure that whatever we do produces a rating point. And when I got in the business 34 years ago, ratings were certainly uh, part and parcel of television news, but there was never such an emphasis on it then as it is now. Longtime journalist Daniel Shore reported in a 2005 article that in 2002, 46 corporations controlled more than 50% of the news media, including 2,000 TV stations. Consolidation has been good for media companies. PEJ reports that some stations can earn pre-tax profit margins as high as 40 to 50%. All four of the stations that do news in Hartford, New Haven are owned by publicly traded companies. In fact, they're part of the list of top 20 media companies in 2007. Lynn owned 29 stations, including WTNH. Meredith owned 14, including WFSB. NBC Universal owned 27, including WVIT. And Tribune owned 23 stations, including Fox 61. When news directors get together and they say, what is it that we do, what is it that we should do, uh, you see a conundrum sometimes because they're not sure because they're not sure their audience knows what what they want. Station-funded research often shows viewers want immediacy. Well, I'm Meredith. I'm Kara Sumlin, Channel 3, Eyewitness News. The problem is that what people in local TV news, by and large, call research, people in research would call, frankly, junk. Uh, inexpensive focus groups, off-the-shelf survey data, um, often it's, it's data that's not even local. It's stuff from some, you know, that, that was done elsewhere. They show it to a, a, a TV news director and a station manager, and then they do a focus group. If you ask people in a survey, tell me what kinds of stories you'd like to see. First of all, the first mistake with that is average people don't know what kinds of stories that could be done. All they really know is that they reference the stories they've seen. So they will tell you, of the stories that I, can, that I can remember that I might have seen sometime, which ones do I remember on the spur of the moment that I liked? You're asking them, you're sort of taking them out of their lives and asking them a very artificial question and you get very predictable and not very interesting answers. 
Do you want news that is important? Do you want news that's interesting? Do you want news that's local and late breaking? Yes, 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 yes. I agree that it's, it's how you phrase the question. And I mean, you can tell uh, an education story or a political story with a sense of urgency and a sense of immediacy. It all has to do with the writing, being active, and how you present the story and move it forward as opposed to just sort of regurgitating the facts. And I think that's what happens with um, crime stories is that it's, it's not so much the sense of urgency. People want a sense of what's going on in their backyard, but I think when you cover so much crime news, it gives the false sense that, well, this is just a crime-ridden city and there's nothing going on except crime, and uh, obviously that's not true. We should be deciding what the viewer needs to see and what information they need to know about as opposed to what they want to know about because our system now is basically not journalism, it's programming. And that's what we're doing. We're finding out what an audience wants to see and then we're supplying them with that product. And that doesn't always translate into good journalism. And oftentimes it's, it, tr it, it translates into uh, very poor journalism. Why don't you watch the news a lot? Because most of the news is depressing and upsetting. They don't you know, show enough happy things that are going on in the world. So I usually try to avoid all those kind of things. I'll just, you know, get some information, what I want, but I won't sit and watch a lot of the bad things that are going on. To cover their bases, newsrooms often end up trying to give viewers a little bit of everything. A buffet table of news, if you will. So the buffet table is, is a great idea if you're really offering them a buffet. But what tends to happen in local TV news, and we know this from uh, not only uh, a study that involved thousands and thousands, I think 30,000 stories that we monitored over the course of five years, but we've also done more than a thousand um, trainings in local newsrooms where we gave people a menu of stories and said, build a newscast based on these stories. What would go first? What would go second? What would go third? What happens is that people take stories that they think are easy to do and are highly visual and they put them first and they give them the most time. They take stories that they think are light and easily teasable or promotable and they save them for last. And they take the stories that they think are important but not visual and they do them as tell stories in the middle. It's an X structure where the time is devoted almost entirely to, to stories that are easy to do and perceived to be easy to make visual. And uh, very little time is given to the stories that are uh, maybe substantive or important but are a little more complicated to do. This structure, which is repeated over and over and over, or, you know, means that in fact your hamburgers are at the front of your buffet and uh, the vegetables are not only overcooked but they look awful and they are sitting in this boiled water and they, no one wants to eat them. Uh, and then, you know, there's a big uh, dessert uh, area. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if, if you take that buffet analogy, it's a kind of a weird looking buffet. I mean, that kind of goes along, doesn't it, with what you're saying, that we are giving people what they want. I mean, Yeah, that's what we are doing, yeah. but we should be giving them uh, the menu of a, a, a three-star Michelin restaurant and let them pick and choose from that, as opposed to a, 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 a 9.95 buffet. That's the problem. We're giving them the cheap menu. We should be giving them a very expensive menu and, and make them think about what they're looking at and, and, and reading. We're not engaging the public in any serious way. We're giving them pep. We're giving them such a superficial view of their world. It's not even a real view of the world. Look at the newscasts that lead with child molestation or, 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 or a, a, a sexual abuse. If you watch most newscasts, you would think the world is filled with those people. And as serious as those crimes are, it's still this much of what really goes on in daily life, yet that's what we give for our lead stories. That's what we put on the air, and we promote those stories because it's, it's titillating. And I don't know what purpose it serves. It's certainly not informing the public in any meaningful way.
thing out, and I'm going to step out of the shot and show you. There's actually, Jess, if you want to come down, there's a nice parking spot right over there uh, on top of where this... Covering stories that are sensationalistic, celebrity-driven, or drama-filled is nothing new for journalism. But this strategy is turning some viewers off. Folks like this Wilton, Connecticut high school history teacher rely more on NPR and the Internet for news. Derek watched on this particular day because we asked him to. You know, just in that half hour, you had plane crash, car crash, train crash. You had a lot of weather. You had um, the, oh, burnt down um, diner. It's the one, the one feel-good story the entire time. The burnt down diner, everybody is helping and, and giving money to help this guy out. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it sort of seems just scripted, and, and you don't really feel like I came away with anything. I didn't learn anything. I don't feel any, you know, smarter or more informed than I was when I, when I started watching it. McMillan says he came home to discrimination. Does it That's one reason why Walt Kane says he hasn't pursued higher paying reporting jobs. Because Cablevision lets him do the kind of stories that have kept him going for more than 20 years. Awards line his office wall at News 12 in Edison, New Jersey. He's especially proud of this one, catching some Elizabeth cops drinking on the job. But Kearns may not have been the highest ranking officer to attend the beer bash on the parking deck just behind police headquarters. Investigators with the Union County Prosecutor's Office say they're looking at this man in the white shirt. They believe he could be an Elizabeth police captain who may have attended the party on duty. Investigators are also... I'm proud to be a journalist with a capital J. Uh, I'm proud to, to represent that type of reporting because that's what it's about. If, you, if you're going to, to differentiate your reporting from everybody else's. You have to break ground. Cool, man. Yeah, we're we're doing the three pack shakur today, noon five six. All right, man. All right, talk with you. Thanks, bye. All right, I gotta get my hide in there. Time, never enough time. Um, you always want to include more. You always have a little uh, snippet or a fact that you want to make sure gets in there. But unfortunately, when you're given a minute and a half, it's never enough time. Uh, never enough time to edit, to make things look nice, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it isn't really that glamorous. I mean, if you look at what I have on, I have to put on my ski pants and my big boots. Uh, but nobody usually sees the boots, so. But if nope. you don't have them, it's a long, wet, uncomfortable day. So, always carry my boots. My no gear. lipstick? I, I did not have lipstick on. I'm hoping nobody at home will notice, so. I do have it. I just forgot to put it on. But producers are not forgetting to lead with attention-grabbing stories. Now on Eyewitness News. The suspect is off the street and behind bars after he is involved. Viewers can get frustrated by having to sit through the first three minutes or so of crime and spot news stories. Tipped off neighbors that something was not right. News Channel A's Bob Wilson is live in Meriden tonight with the strange details of what Are the first three minutes of the newscast uh, maybe bad news or um, crime-ridden news? A lot of times it's breaking news. Um, and that usually isn't good news. Breaking news usually isn't good news, but our job is to cover what's happening now and give you the most immediate information. So a lot of times, most immediate happening now often means crime. When Erin does a non-crime story that takes time to research and some shoe leather reporting, she can come up with interesting and worthwhile stories, such as how some Waterbury city workers pinch their relatives' handicap stickers to get access to better parking spots. Wendy Holzer heads up the Naugatuck Handicap Commission and wonders why the workers did it. So did we. Hi. Is Lorraine here? We tried, but we're unable to talk to the six employees now facing a $131 fine. The first time, fine. This story appeared as the eighth story on 11 p.m. newscast. After two car crash stories, a stabbing, 
and a voyeurism charge at an apartment complex. Could park in the spot. The employees can either pay the covering the news is one thing. Covering the kitchen door windows with curtains is another. Yes, but I did. I hemmed them too. <laughs> And I told you I'm not very domestic or, or creative, but uh, yes, I hemmed him. Oh, here comes my husband. Katisha Cosley and her husband Frank lived in this East Hartford house for four years, but had little time to do much interior decorating. She was a Fox 61 reporter before moving on to a Houston TV station in mid-2007. TV news isn't exactly a family-friendly business. That's another thing I don't know if we mentioned, but... Babies in this industry are another sacrifice. <laughs> I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, but it's not that common, or at least it happens later on. So, how, how do you feel about that? You know, it's okay. Um, you know, I'm 33, so you know, I'm not the youngest guy in the world. Um, so, it's something you know, I hope happens in the next couple of years. Again, I'm not pressing her because she's still young, but. Uh, I don't know how it's received in the industry, you know, when you're young. So that's just one thing you have to keep in mind if you want to go into this field. Starting a family is tough when there's barely time to eat together. The holidays, you know, how many holidays have I missed? It's funny, this year I got all the holidays off. My husband was like, my gosh, all the holidays. So in seven years, it was worth something. I guess I got... Uh, I got to have Thanksgiving at home, I got to have Christmas at home, and the New Year at home. So, it, you know, those are, those are things that sometimes you take for granted. But again, you're right, there are a lot of sacrifices that have to be made. Um, I got married when I was 23 years old, so just out of college, and, you know, so many people told me, oh, that's not happening. You know, it's not, you're not going to be able to do this business and be married at the same time. Of course, I've, I've proved them wrong, uh, being married five years now. But, you know, I, we had to do... You know, I, I, we've had to do a lot of things apart because of my schedule. My husband's in sales, so his schedule is very, very flexible, and he can. And I think maybe that might be a reason that this has all worked because he's been able to be flexible around my crazy schedules. Hi, Hi how, how are, are you? you? I spent a lot of time at his house. That's why I said <laughs> this was a good night in New London. Katisha and photographer Garrett Allison got to cover a meeting with strong content and found time to eat. Definitely, eating and running, eating on the go. So how often is this dinner for you? Well, this is actually a good one because we have 30 minutes. Typically, we're scarfing it while we're driving, so at least we can sit down. And this is a good night. Good, but not stress-free. The story was about a public hearing on whether a proposed floating liquefied natural gas facility should be built in Long Island Sound. But a soundbite with the Attorney General was on the wrong channel and couldn't be used. You know, it's the last one. Why don't you go ahead and start putting B-roll on there and I'll try to find something else. I, I just, I can't use it. That's horrible. I just need somebody on the... What if I just ended it jump on board and just show him out there? the average customer would save four hundred dollars a year with this terminal but even that isn't enough incentive for governor jody rell or attorney general richard blumenthal to jump on board now tonight representatives from the coast guard said the terminal could go forward as long as there are additional steps for security that are taken and i think it is worth it if it if it weren't i wouldn't be able to stay in it this long you know if it wasn't something that i truly loved i wouldn't keep coming back for more <laughs> for more of the headache sometimes that the daily grind of this business causes. On this night, the Fox 61 crew didn't get back to Hartford until after midnight. Typical for an out-of-town assignment. Long days can make connecting with the family tough. After Len's busy day of doing the rape story for three newscasts, he types up another story about kids escaping from a detention center. It means missing pizza night with his daughters. I think a lot of people get out of the business early, present company not included, uh, because maybe they do get bored. Because if you just are on this treadmill of fires and murders and sex and corruption, that in many cases you're being handed by the desk and you're running with a press pack and a photographer's photographer who says this story is stupid after 10 or 12 years I could see you or 15 whatever I could see you getting sick of just the treadmill of the same old story 
you know, just different names and different faces. And that's what's so cool about finding my own story, is that it's never the same. Derek Schlapp was in TV news for nine and a half years. He left to get into politics, becoming the spokesman for New Haven's mayor, who later ran for governor. I did have a frustration um, because uh, I don't know necessarily that you know the business changed, but I think I changed, and um, I was interested in in doing kind of longer format stories and stories that you couldn't come in, um, you know, at ten in the morning and have on the air by five o'clock. I mean, and you know, I think I had just gotten to a point where the spot news wasn't um, stimulating me. It wasn't intellectually stimulating for me anymore. It's, you know, it was fun fighting for something, you know? It was really fun fighting for something. After the defeat, Derek moved on to work for Connecticut's Secretary of State. But for many who decide to stay in journalism, change can't happen soon enough. I'd like to see it go back. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the time when, you know, we had an hour-long newscast and you got five-minute pieces and you did in-depth things and you didn't have to do everything every day. I mean, that's not going to happen, but, um, you know, that's what every reporter and photographer would like. I think it's changing so much with the Internet and with all, you know, the bandwidth is, is expanding, so now we're going to have all these other channels and it's, I don't know where it's going to go. And we have technology that's, you know, that's also improving on a daily basis. I, I think that there's a st constant struggle between now that they're owned, now that the stations are owned by businesses, it's become a business, it's about making money, it's about getting more for less, and that I think hurts because it really is also a public service, and I think that they forget that. It's, it's that constant struggle between making money and actually doing some good, and sometimes I think that it, that it uh, goes towards the business side a little too much. You know, in the end, journalism and the, pr and the professional ethics and standards of journalism are, uh, come out of simply what is the people need from the news. It's, they don't come from some higher place. They don't come from a, the planet journalism or Mount Olympus of journalism. They come out of what is it citizens need. And if journalism stops serving uh, those needs, uh, it'll wither and something else will come up and, and replace it. Um, I think we're in the middle of a transition. Um, when we get, you know, th all the way through it, I'm pretty confident that uh, journalism will actually be better. Uh, but it could be more than the rest of my life before we're through it. Not far from Tom's office in Washington, a park appears to wither a park named after the man who has come to symbolize quality journalism, Edward R. Murrow. Keep in mind, even he had to fight for quality journalism during his 22 years on air at CBS. Not far from Murrow Park is where something could have been done. In 1934, Congress established the Federal Communications Commission to make sure the public's interest would be served. But critics say the FCC has dropped the ball over the years. Back in the 1970s, it allowed each media company to own seven TV stations. Today, a company can own enough stations to reach up to 39% of the national audience. Some people want to put the FCC's feet to the fire and slow down consolidation. In 2003, media activists filed suit in a federal appellate court to stop the FCC from allowing more companies to buy up more TV stations. It worked, but for how long? So maybe we should ask, who else can make a difference? Basically just a bunch of emails that they got from people saying that there was a problem. So. Yeah. Well, we can tie it all together. Well, you know, we either have to confirm it or not confirm it. Since journalists can make a difference with their stories, maybe they can do the same within their own newsrooms. Okay, so that will help us out a lot. I think people in local TV news, whether they're the news director or a young reporter, have to be kind of the entrepreneurs of their own careers. They have to do work that they're satisfied 
uh, with uh, and uh, work against the tide of an industry that is pushing them in a different direction sometimes. Uh, wor always have a story going that you really believe in, that you think is really important, and that you might not have an easy time selling. If all you're doing, if all you're pitching, if all you're working on is the story that you pitched in a story meeting that, that day, no one's going to be happy. The viewers aren't going to be happy. Your news director is not going to be happy. And I know that the reporter is not going to be happy. So you can't give up. You've got to continue to, to give that story idea every day. You know, pitch the story. Tell them, hey, I really want to do this. You know, find a reason why they might want to, um, you know, to run the story. And, and then you'll start getting your stuff on little by little. There's uh, something to be said for the old adage that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I think you got to be persistent. If you're, if you're a good reporter, you're persistent in the field, be persistent with your manager in the newsroom. And, and, and uh, I don't think that's going to hurt. And, and who knows, you might get the opportunity from time to time to do what you want to do. I think you got to ask yourself why you're doing this. And this is something I say to a lot of different people, uh, whether it's photographers, producers, assignment editors, you got to always sort of be looking forward at what's the end goal? Why am I in this business? What am I trying to work toward? Or where am I going to be happy? And you got to, if it's really not about storytelling, then you need to be doing something else. And that's a, a very hard reality for a lot of people to face. And most won't or don't or don't want to. It's all by, you know, Sounds doing good. it the old-fashioned way. Like uh, my old news director in Raleigh used to say, he said, you know, you work the shoe leather, and you got to do that. Len Beskoff, Channel 3, Eyewitness News. It worked for Len. His news director promised to give him two days off each week to spend more time researching in-depth stories, like this computer-assisted story in 2006. It was about how 1,000 inmates escaped from various correctional facilities in Connecticut. He got four minutes and ten seconds for the story, a far cry from the usual minute 30. He escaped from a minimum security prison in Enfield and fled to Florida. Still, this wasn't the lead story at 11 o'clock. It was the second story. The lead story was about a police chase in New Haven that ended in a car crash. Four people were injured, but not seriously. Spot News may take the lead because that's business today, but fortunately some reporters, like the ones you have just met, still take journalism seriously. The question is, will the next generation take journalism just as seriously? I do believe in journalism as a sacred trust. Maybe that's old fashioned, but I still believe in that. I think that we have a responsibility to serve our viewers. And to be able to do that, we need people getting into this business because they want to be journalists not because they want to be on TV. If, if people who are teaching on the college level uh, broadcast journalism or journalism, if they, if they find students in their class who are more interested in being on the air and on television, they should strongly urge those people to get out of the business and don't encourage them to move forward. Because the more people we get into the business who simply want to uh, know how to use pancake makeup and hairspray and look good on television and advance to be some type of a, a news celebrity, the more of those people we have, the worse it's going to be. Or they didn't care at all. They agree you. But there is hope. Some young people do have the passion. If I had a chance to, to talk to management, you know, I would just give them the, not necessarily advice, but the suggestion of saying, guys, you know, rethink your, your format. And you guys are news, you're not entertainment. I have this fantasy of being the great crusader who makes everything all and well, but unfortunately the, the reality is that I can't make TV news what I feel it should be. Um, at the very least though, I feel that I can try to do my part and be a role model for future generations who want to go into this business and maybe ignite that flame in them that, hey, I have a responsibility, I am a journalist, and that I should be responsible to my boss. And in reality, the boss is the public. LTSJ, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Take one cue. 
and Kevin doing call comments. Ideally, whatever I do in this business, whether it's television, whether it's radio, whether it's print journalism, I want to be able. I want it to be in a forum where I can give the viewers or my readers or whoever they may be the context uh, that a story deserves and and there are so many stories that you just don't get any context you don't get well what's really important what's what's important to me uh, it's more about what looks good and what's trendy my advice to the media owners is uh, remember what the point of news is to inform people I think that they forget that a lot and that um, it's not we're in a society it's tough that we teach a society of of wanting money and um, being the best but it's it's really we need to look out for one another and, and the, the point of getting into this business is is to inform people and to deliver the news and I think they forget that and the audience should not forget it can make a difference the public needs to demand that if the public demands it the corporations will respond the same way whether they respond now to what the public is demanding, and what the public is demanding is basically the front page of the National Enquirer. And then they need to demand what's on the front page of the New York Times. Th that will make things better. But it's really up to the public to put this pressure on. There's only so much those of us in this craft can do. Uh, the public needs to want better news. And if they want better news, we'll for sure give it to them. They sure do whine. I mean, when we went <laughs> to downtown New Haven and did an MOS. And, you know, but what, you know what, and those, I bet you a lot of those people that maybe whined about the news will go home and flip on, uh, you know, Hollywood Tonight or whatever what, what those programs are and watch that rather than watching PBS. And finally, maybe the toughest challenge is for journalists to send a strong enough signal to media owners. What I think we can do is convince the boards of directors of these huge corporations that you can still make a profit on good content and that we have to convince the GEs of the world and the Disneys of the world and all the and, and the news groups of the world that own most of the media outlets in this country that what they're producing are not automobiles or widgets or light bulbs or tanks or or electronic parts we're producing a public service and you, you, these corporations can demand the higher profit margins in all those other areas, but they need to be, to be willing to accept a not no profit, but a lower profit margin in exchange for good public service. You know, you just got to shake it off. It's TV, it's live. Do it all again tomorrow. Do it all again tomorrow.